O primeiro Guardiões da Galáxia pegou todo mundo de surpresa e por conta disso, James Gunn teve uma liberdade criativa ainda maior para construir a continuação. Agora, era a responsabilidade do diretor encontrar espaço para desenvolver personagens secundários e tocar em temas tão profundos que eventualmente ajudariam seu elenco a lidar com problemas pessoais. Esse é Guardiões da Galáxia 2. Showtime, a-holes. It'll be here any minute. Which will be its loss. I thought your thing was a sword. We've been hired to stop an interdimensional beast from feeding on those batteries, and I'm gonna stop it with a sword. It's just swords were your thing, and guns were mine. But I guess we're both doing guns now. I just didn't know that. Drax, why aren't you wearing one of Rocket's arrow rigs? It hurts. It hurts. I have sensitive nipples. <laughs> My nipples hurt. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> What about him? What's he doing? I'm finishing this so we can listen to tunes while we work. How is that a priority? Blame Quill! He's the one who loves music so much. No, I actually agree with Drax on this. That's hardly important right now. Oh, okay. Sure, Quill. No, seriously, I side with Drax. No, I understand that. You're being very serious right now. I can clearly see you winking. Damn it. Using my left eye? I am hurt. Hey, we're not looking at you funny. Após o enorme sucesso de Guardiões da Galáxia, rapidamente a Marvel tratou de confirmar a continuação. Gunn havia deixado algumas pontas soltas e, por conta disso, queria que a sequência acontecesse apenas alguns meses após a aventura original. Ou seja, mesmo sendo lançada após Vingadores 2, Guerra Civil, Homem-Formiga e Doutor Estranho, esse filme se passaria antes de todos eles, especialmente por conta de temas importantes que o diretor queria explorar, como a busca pelo pai do Senhor das Estrelas. I think... I knew where I wanted to go before the first film was successful because I came up with the basic the basic structure of a plot during the shooting of Guardians Volume 1. Um, I also knew a lot before I ever even started shooting while I was writing the first screenplay about the background of Peter Quill and Yandu and all of that. So I, I knew I knew what the general shape of the sequel was going to be. I think the thing I didn't really know was, you know, was I going to tell this, the story of Peter Quill and his father as volume two, which I thought was the big reveal, or was I was, you know, maybe perhaps save it for a later time. And uh, I decided, well, I think that's the best story I have at hand right now. So that's what I went with. All these years, I've found you. And who the hell are you? I figured my rugged good looks would make that obvious. My name is Ego. And I'm your dad, Peter. Gunn logo começou a procurar possibilidades para o roteiro e o personagem que mais trabalhou foi Yondo. A relação dele com Peter Quill havia ficado nas entrelinhas no primeiro filme, e agora ele queria mostrar que o verdadeiro pai do herói sempre foi o alienígena interpretado por Michael Rooker. Mas para fazer isso ele precisava encontrar um ator poderoso e carismático para viver ego, o vilão do filme e pai biológico de Quill. Achar um ator assim não é fácil, e o cineasta estava com dificuldade em definir um nome para o papel. Foi nesse momento que Chris Pratt sugeriu um dos seus ídolos, Kurt Russell. Welcome, everyone, to my world. Wow. Kurt is a naturally likable guy. Kurt tells a story, which is about uh, when he was about to shoot Escape from New York, Snake Plissken, which was one of my favorite movies as a kid. And the studio heads were reading the script, and they're going, this character is completely unlikable. Why are we going to care about this movie? And Kurt said, because he's played by me, and I'm just a naturally likable guy. And that's, that's what Kurt Russell is. He is a naturally likable guy, both in person and on screen. He's a legit stud. He was a professional baseball player. He's a pilot, a father, an outdoorsman. I asked him if he'd be my dad in real life, and uh, I'm still waiting to hear back. The relationship between Peter and his father was really important and I thought it was handled extremely well by him in terms of what's relatable. Over the millions and millions of years of my existence, I've made many mistakes, Peter. But you're not one of them. 
please give me the chance to be the father she would want me to be? There's so much that I need to teach you about this planet and the light within. They are a part of you, Peter. What do you mean? O embate para definir o verdadeiro pai de Quill estava claro para o cineasta, que decidiu ao mesmo tempo mostrar como as relações familiares moldaram cada um dos personagens principais. Apesar de ter um papel pequeno, Sylvester Stallone seria fundamental na vida de Yondo, vivendo uma espécie de pai severo no começo para no fim perceber o verdadeiro valor de seu filho. Gunn queria que a cena final de Stallone fosse bastante calorosa e mostrasse como a visão de destacar mudou em relação a Yondo. Por isso pediu para o ator usar como base em sua última fala uma cena de Baby o Porquinho Atrapalhado, Onde o fazendeiro finalmente aceita o animal como ele é. That little pig. That'll do. He didn't let us down after all, Captain. No, he did not, son. He did not. Essas relações entre pais e filhos mexeram profundamente com Chris Pratt. O ator havia perdido seu pai em 2014 enquanto filmava outro blockbuster, o Jurassic World, e nunca havia passado verdadeiramente pelo luto uma vez que não era muito ligado com ele. Com o filme, ele disse que foi obrigado a rasgar feridas que ainda não estavam totalmente curadas e entendeu o significado de sua perda. That relationship is so important. That was like the it was the major thread for 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 Quill and, and his in his story in this movie and when James first told me the movie before Kurt was even ever a part of it it just moved me to tears Ao mesmo tempo que Quill lidava com seus pais, os guardiões tinham seus próprios problemas familiares, especialmente com Gamora e Nebula. A história das duas foi mais explorada no filme, revelando o passado conturbado entre elas. Zoe Saldana e Karen Gillan puderam se concentrar muito mais em suas personagens durante o set, especialmente por conta da evolução na maquiagem. Ao contrário do primeiro filme onde elas levavam horas para ficarem prontas, o tempo reduziu para cerca de uma hora e Gillan nem precisou raspar todo o seu cabelo como havia feito no longo. Gamora have always had a bit of a turbulent relationship, shall we say? Both of them are suffering from pretty severe daddy issues when their dad is Thanos. So in the first film, they kind of ended on a pretty bad note. Um, they were in a major fight sequence together and then Nebula chops off her hand and escapes. So when we meet them in the second film, Nebula is still pretty pissed off at Gamora. Your people promised something in exchange for our services. Bring it and we shall gladly be on our way. Aliás, a maquiagem chegou num nível tão alto em relação ao primeiro filme que a versão jovem de Kurt Russell não foi CGI como diversos fãs estavam especulando. Na verdade, tudo foi feito no próprio set de filmagem com um trabalho que evitou ao máximo a computação gráfica para rejuvenescer o ator. Eu acho que você viu isso antes e você viu o que eles podem fazer com CGI e especial efeitos. E nós assumimos que haveria muito disso aqui. Mas há um homem chamado Dennis Lidyard, que é o meu make-up man, e nós fizemos 28 filmes juntos. And before we got going, he said to them, um, you know, to James and the cinematographer, you know, I can really age him down a lot. I know his face really well. And I got a lot of things I can use here to, to bring him down. Would that be helpful to you? And they said, yeah, anything that you can do there would be helpful, and then we can look at it. But when he finished making me up, and I had my wardrobe and hair going, and, it, and I kind of like got in the mood of being <laughs> there, you know, like, wow, that's amazing. But what's interesting about it is, it not only did it look amazing, um, you're much freer. And I didn't have this sense that there was going to be... I've seen that done, and so far, and they get better and better and better at it, but so far it has something about it that you kind of go, it's kind of mm -hmm. creepy, weird. This doesn't have that. Yeah. And it's because he did what he did, and um, you take makeup, hair, wardrobe, and an actor, and you, you make them work well together, I think you can create a pretty great uh, impression. Look. Oh, it's beautiful. I was afraid it wouldn't take to the soil, but it rooted quickly. And soon, it'll be everywhere, all across the universe. 
<laughs> well, I don't know what you're talking about, but I like the way you say it. Oh, my heart is yours, Meredith Quill. I can't believe I fell in love with a space man. Outro que se beneficiou com a evolução da maquiagem foi o David Bautista, que vive o Drax, um dos personagens que mais mudou em relação ao primeiro filme. Mas não foi fisicamente não, foi psicologicamente. Drax era um ser que respirava e vivia em busca de vingança, mas na continuação, Gunn queria mostrar um outro lado do personagem. E por isso, fugiu completamente dos quadrinhos, algo que surpreendeu até o David Bautista, que inicialmente não gostou do que leu e ficou com medo de viver essa nova versão do herói. Yeah, when I read, first read the script, you know, because I thought they were going to go a different direction with Drax, I was kind of expecting one thing. And then when I saw that James had really tapped in, into uh, Drax's humor a lot more, uh, I just, you know, I got it at first, but I just, because I don't find myself very funny, when I was reading, I just didn't know if it was funny or not. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually realized how funny it was when, it, when we did the first table read with the whole cast and the director. And then I found myself kind of laughing out loud and people laughing out loud at me. <laughs> uh, so that's when it kind of started to click and I started to feel a little bit more, you know, uh, comfortable. Can I pet your puppy? It is adorable. Yes. <laughs> that is called a practical joke. <laughs> Todas essas mudanças em relação ao primeiro filme visavam mostrar como cada personagem evoluiu. E a mudança mais significativa, é claro, era o Baby Groot. Vin Diesel voltou como dublador e se no primeiro filme ele havia dublado o personagem em seis línguas, dessa vez os produtores lhe pediram para aumentar esse número para 16. Como era uma versão infantil do alienígena, sua voz foi alterada na pós-produção para casar melhor com o pequeno herói. Mas essa foi a parte fácil, pois no set as coisas complicaram. Ao contrário da versão adulta, onde era possível usar um stand como referência, dessa vez a produção precisava encontrar uma outra solução. Então, eles decidiram criar um boneco de cerca de 25 centímetros para que os atores e a fotografia tivessem noção de como o personagem ficaria na tela. That gave me and the cast and everyone else involved a much greater sense that there was this little character there on set all the time. Oh man, what did they do to you? There is something about him that works in a way where your heart just melts, but he's also a bit of a jerk. That selfish, jerky attitude is what makes him work. He is unbelievably adorable at times, but if he just was unbelievably adorable all the time, it would just get so saccharine we couldn't handle it, because he also does kill people. Okay, we're set, and three, two, one, go. Baby Groot é destaque do filme desde a primeira cena do grupo, onde são exibidos os créditos iniciais. A cena demorou cerca de dois anos para ser planejada, pois é uma combinação de CGI com cenas gravadas no próprio set de filmagem. E como tinha uma visão muito clara de como Groot dançaria, o próprio Gunn decidiu servir de base para os animadores. Baby Groot é muito mais inocente e frágil em relação ao personagem original. E há pouco tempo, o Gunn explicou que o Groot do primeiro filme morreu, e o que vimos é o filho dele. É por isso que ele não sabe apertar o botão da bomba mortal e tem dificuldade de entender tarefas simples, tratando Rocket basicamente como seu irmão mais velho. The drawer you want to open has this symbol on it, ok? What? No! 
He thinks you want him to wear it as a hat. That's not what I said. I'm Groot. He's relieved you don't want him to. I'm Groot. He hates hats. I'm Groot. On anyone, not just himself. I'm Groot. One minute you think someone has a weird shaped head, the next minute it's just because you realize part of that head is the hat. That's why you don't like hats? This is an important conversation right now. Bradley Cooper voltou para fazer a voz do Guaxinim e dessa vez a produção decidiu usar o rosto do ator como base para as falas de Rocket. Além disso, Cooper conseguiu criar uma conexão verdadeira com o Guaxinim, entendendo melhor a jornada por qual Rocket passou. Por isso, ele controlou a voz do personagem com muito mais facilidade. They were not looking at you funny. You got anger issues. Mature yourself. I think, you know, we talked early on. We had a couple of conversations on the phone before he was even hired to do the first movie. And we talked a lot about Joe Pesci and what Joe Pesci was like. Huh. Uh, we talked a little bit about how I saw the character, how I saw him talking. I had a pretty, you know, distinct idea of what Rocket sounded like. Um, and uh, and he would do different voices for me on the phone. I'm like, yeah, I think like that, like this, like that. So that by the time he came into the recording booth, the first time around, we had a pretty uh, a good idea of what he sounded like. Mm -hmm. But I think Bradley has found that voice a lot more on the second movie than on the first movie. Yeah. It took a lot more tries on the first movie. Second movie, he came in and just kind of nailed it. <laughs> what the hell you doing, boy? I could tell by how you talked about him. This ego's uh, bad news. We're here to save Quill. For what? Huh? For honor? For love? No, I don't care about uh, those things. I want to save Quill so I can prove I'm better than him. I can lord this over him forever. <laughs> what are you laughing at me for? Uh, you can fool yourself and everyone else, but you can't fool me. I know who you are. You don't know anything about me, loser. I know everything about you. I know you play like you're the meanest and the hardest, but actually you're the most scared of all. Shut up! I know you steal batteries you don't need, and you push away anyone who's willing to put up with you, because just a little bit of love reminds you how big and empty that hole inside you actually is. I said shut up! I know them scientists what made you never gave a rat's ass about you! I'm serious, dude! Just like my own damn parents who sold me! Go, little baby, into slavery. I know who you are, boy, because you're me. Todas as mudanças foram aprovadas pela Marvel, que deu total liberdade para Gamma mexer com os personagens. Ego, por exemplo, não é o pai de Quill nos quadrinhos, e o estúdio confiava tanto na visão do cineasta que entrou em uma negociação com a Fox para conseguir os direitos do planeta vivo. A produção apoiava tanto a visão de Gun que até a participação de Stan Lee foi diferente, e ele apareceu ao lado dos Vigias, justificando sua aparição em todos os outros filmes da produtora. Anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted, at that time I was a Federal Express man. Porém, nem todas as mudanças foram aprovadas pelos envolvidos no projeto. O co-criador de Mantis, Steve Englehart, criticou abertamente o uso da personagem. Disse que até conseguia assistir o filme caso desligasse seu cérebro para o fato de que aquela não era sua criação. What are those? If I touch someone, I can feel their feelings. You read minds? No. Telepaths no thoughts. Empaths feel feelings, emotions. May I? Oh, all right. You feel love. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I feel a general unselfish love for just about everybody. No, romantic. No, no, I don't. For her. No, that is not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's. <laughs> she just told everyone your deepest, darkest secret, dude. <laughs> come on, I think you're overreacting a little bit. You must be so embarrassed. The act of creating Mantis was a great one. Um, I felt that character quite a bit. I wanted to uh, add a female character who was. Um, as goofy and silly and strange as uh, the other male characters, basically Drax and Rocket and Groot, who are all just goofballs. And Groot's, I don't know if Groot's, what Groot is, a man or a woman really, but uh, its uh, but I wanted to, to have a female character that had that same oddness as those other characters. And, uh, and we auditioned uh, a, a lot of actresses for that role, and uh, Pom just happened to be the best in terms of 
being very emotional, which the character has to be that by her nature is her superpower, so to speak. She's an empath. Uh, and also just so alien at the same time. A personagem funcionou melhor do que o esperado junto aos outros guardiões, que apresentaram novos mundos, novas raças, e logo nas primeiras prévias deixaram o público empolgado, especialmente com mais uma trilha sonora especial selecionada por James Gunn. Fox on the Run, do grupo Switch, chegou pela primeira vez no topo da lista do iTunes após ser exibida no trailer. O diretor mais uma vez selecionou músicas conhecidas e ao mesmo tempo canções nunca ouvidas pelo público geral, criando uma trilha sonora única. I put together a soundtrack that worked in telling a story within the movie. So I just had to remain true to myself and do the second soundtrack in that same way. It really is what works best for the movie. What tells the story of Peter Quill's relationship with his mother, of uh, Ego's relationship with Peter Quill's mother. What are those songs that meet, are about those things? And I think that we came out with something really special because of it. It really changes from moment to moment, but I have a list of about 500 songs on my computer that are all songs that I think of as Guardians type songs. And so as I'm going through and I need a song for a particular scene, I'll, I'll imagine the scene, I'll play a bunch of different songs to see what fits the best. Um, sometimes it's, I can't find the right song, and so I have to go through another group of songs. Sometimes I go into a scene knowing I want to use a song like I did with you know, Fleetwood Mac, The Chain, or mm -hmm. Brandy, you know, which a lot of stuff in the movie is based around the song Brandy. So it, it really goes from scene to scene and depends, but they're all baked into the script. They're all a part of it from the beginning. Oh, he's got it! O cineasta se empolgou tanto com a trilha que arriscou-se a compor uma canção inédita, Guardians Inferno, que foi composta junto de Tyler Bates. Para dar vida à música, o diretor manteve-se fiel aos personagens do longa e chamou David Hasselhoff para cantar, uma vez que o ator é um dos heróis de infância de Peter Quill. Além disso, ele criou um clipe fora de série inspirado nos anos 80 com participação de alguns atores da produção. Got no people skills, but he's good with motor. That weird thing by his side, an infantilized sequoia. The two of them who walk by, people say, oh boy. They ask me why I'm bringing a baby into battle. That's really irresponsible and getting them. Guardiões da Galáxia Volume 2 sofreu a pressão de superar o filme original, mas conseguiu entregar um filme tão interessante e divertido quanto o primeiro. O filme somou mais de 863 milhões de dólares na bilheteria e comprovou que os heróis poderiam sim ser uma das principais franquias da Marvel. Tanto é que o terceiro filme está aprovado e a expectativa é que Gunn crie um derivado do universo dos mercenários, que pode até explorar Adam Warlock. Foi apresentado em uma das cinco cenas pós-créditos do filme. Hi Priestess, the council is waiting. They are perturbed I've wasted our resources. When they see what I have created here, their wrath will dissipate. It's a new type of birthing pod, man? That, my child, is the next step in our evolution. More powerful, more beautiful, more capable of destroying the guardians of the galaxy. I think I shall call him Adam. <laughs> <laughs> 
Depois de apresentar o Homem-Aranha em Guerra Civil, a Marvel finalmente tem a oportunidade de criar um filme solo do Teioso em seu universo cinematográfico. O herói vinha de uma série de longas decepcionantes e muitos acreditavam que o personagem estava desgastado com o público. Porém, Kevin Feige e o estúdio pensavam completamente diferente. Surgia assim Homem-Aranha de Volta ao Lar.